1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Welcome to one God, one church. That's our mission statement. <laughs> Pleading with all Christians to unite to be one. A divided house falls, doesn't it? And we are definitely falling. I say it a lot. Just turn around and look. Get your head out of the sand. Look around you. Watch real news and you'll see. All you have to do is look around, just go to your children's school if you have children or grandchildren and see what's happening. So, um, if this is your first time, I just want to welcome you with a smile. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> and uh, we are One God, One Church, true Bible-believing church. Uh, we follow, we are good, Karen and I are all about uh, the history of the church and following what the apostles did and their disciples they celebrated a liturgy. Look it up. It's truth. Does that mean you don't go to heaven if you go to a church that doesn't? No. But why wouldn't you want what the apostles did? I say that a lot, don't I? And in that liturgy of the Mass, there was a certain format. But one thing is for sure. Just look up any words. Just look up the Last Supper. How important communion was the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ right so every time we gather together we take communion and I'll talk more about that probably later because you know me I like to ramble on and on and on <laughs> but um, so we celebrate that so we have an opening prayer we have readings we have a homily we have our Eucharistic prayer, we take communion, and we close. <clears throat> All right? And what we've been doing recently is starting off with a song. And today's song, Wisdom, it's called. <clears throat> Hope you enjoyed it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, it's called Wisdom, right? Because especially in today's world, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom, right? And discernment. And if we pray to the Holy Spirit, and we must pray to the Holy Spirit, I don't care what you've been told, okay, you said a prayer, and now the Holy Spirit's in you, and you're done with the Holy Spirit. No. Pray for wisdom. Pray for discernment. It was the Holy Spirit who descended upon the apostles in the upper room on Pentecost to give them their tongues of fire which really was their courage to speak boldly, knowing that what they were going to say and do would result in them dying, being martyred, except for John, the beloved of Jesus, right? The one Jesus loved the most, John, the name John, right? So that's pretty much our format, all righty? And uh, so... Uh, again, on wisdom, that's what we heard first, and hope you enjoyed it. Try to pick songs that are um, more just calming, and, and with the scriptures on there, we love Daystar because of what it does. How you could sit and watch and read those scriptures and just feel motivated and inspired, and hopefully pray and meditate on them, okay? So that's it. That's our format in a nutshell. That's who we are in a nutshell. We're a Bible-believing church. We want to uh, just pray that um, all Christians will be united. We need to somehow unite. And uh, so, I, I don't know how that gets done. I really don't. It's going to take a Billy Graham type. So, um, we'll just... Uh, let it be there, let it uh, stop there or whatever, all right? <clears throat> so we'll bow our heads and we'll say our opening prayer, okay? Grant us, O Lord, our God, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, the wisdom to find you, 
conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance in waiting for you, and the hope of finally embracing you. Heavenly Father, speak to us that we may be makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, and in our world. And may we become one body under your authority. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the first part of that prayer are the words of St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay? I thought they were really good. All righty. <clears throat> so our readings, our first reading today is from Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for he has appointed a time for every matter and for every work. was actually going to have the opening song be turn, turn, turn by the birds, right? There was a time every season, right? <laughs> but I didn't. Anyway, the psalm for today, <laughs> Psalm 1, which we say a lot, verses 1 to 2, because of what it says, we have this a lot. Blessed the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked, nor walks in the ways of sinners, nor sits in the company of the insolent, but delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. Okay, not one prayer and you're done and you're saved. There's so much more to our journey to heaven. And our second reading today is from Ephesians. So it's chapter 5, verses 3 to 8. <clears throat> Immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be mentioned among you, as is fitting among the holy ones. No obscenity or silly or suggestive talk, which is out of place, but instead thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no immoral or impure or greedy person, that is, an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient. So do not be associated with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light, light in the Lord. So live as children of the light. Wow. Oh, I thought the Gospels and the Jesus was all about, and Paul were all about love. Love, love, love and tolerance. Hmm. <clears throat> so, now, giving pre preparation for our Gospel. We say, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And that's from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7, verses 3 to 14. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And here we have the Gospel of the Lord, right? And we say, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We make the sign of the cross on our foreheads, on our lips, and on our hearts. You don't have to even think about what that means, right? And today's gospel is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 to 23. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They come by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. 
A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And we say the gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And all the social justice warriors that claim to be Catholics and other types of and Christians in general use the gospel of St. Matthew, say that's the social justice gospel, all about love and tolerance. That is a direct statement to the pastors of our world, the pastors and the priests. You think about it, you read it. You will know them by their fruit and they Bad tree cannot bear good fruit, can it? So don't, oh, we accept this badness and we're going to turn it good. You're not going to. You're just not. So we talked about this several times before, and I know we'll be talking about it again. Because we're human beings and we need to hear the same thing over and over, right? It's like the liberal left. They say the same lies over and over again. Because they know over time, if they all keep repeating the same words of the same lies, eventually, not all, but some people will believe those lies. That the same thing happens in our churches. Alrighty? So, um, today's message, your church might be woke if. How's that? And uh, before I go into it, because I'm going to interject some things, Karen and I were blessed, and it was a blessing to see Charlie Kirk, and he spoke at a church in Spokane Valley, so 20 minutes from here. It was Valley Assembly Church of God um, in Spokane Valley, and it was an amazing, amazing event. You know, we watched Charlie Kirk on Real America's Voice on his show, and uh, he's totally different when he's speaking to church at churches, to a congregation. It's unbelievable how bold he is and what he says. And he does speak a lot of truth. And we're going to, I'm going to try to remember some of the things to interject, because I had already, already written this like last Wednesday or Thursday. It's been on my heart to talk about this again, especially with our elections coming up. But what you're hearing in your churches, so many of the churches are really, really bad. Right? is really bad. And this I give credit to my sweetheart Karen. Karen found this, uh, some of this, that I'm going to read to you from uh, crosswalk.com. So I give them full credit, okay, for some of this. And uh, what thing, they were basically things to watch out for in your church, where your church might be a progressive church and not a true traditional Catholic church, right? So let me just start, okay? So there are many pastors, priests, and church leaders who are embracing the social justice gospel, selecting certain phrases and using them to force change in the church here in America. And by the looks of things, they are succeeding. I'll never forget something I heard in a meeting well over a decade ago. At that time, I was blessed to be part of a church in Irvine, California, that had a men's group, right? And that men's group was led by a big man full of life, loved the Lord and loved men. His name was Jan Gilbert, right? And I've mentioned Jan before, okay? He was kind of rough around the edges, kind of like me in a way where I speak a lot of times before my brain really tells me not to say that, but he always meant well. He was a great man, and we know he is in heaven today. All right? 
So there were a few of us from that group that were able to attend a weekly Friday morning men's gathering, all right? And was that like from, actually from like six to eight in the morning. And that's why I said blessed to attend. So many people have to work. I was blessed to be with my brother Jake and we were able to go do this. And that men's group was called the Band of Brothers. The pastor that led that group was a man by the name of Pete McKenzie, right? And the meeting I was privy to was one where two men were going to meet with Pete about starting their own church, all right? So they were Bill and Bucky, all right? And they came from Mariner's Church, and they were going to try to do their own thing, an offshoot. And it was really Bill. Bill Gaultier, I've mentioned him before. His dad, Jim, bless him too. We know where he is today. But they really wanted to do something different for the believers in Southern California. All right? Meditation, contemplation. Bill is a lot about that. So they wanted a more of a contemplative church rather than a feel-good seeker church, right? Which is what's so prevalent in our nation today. So um, here's what Pete said to them when they were explaining the concept. He said, it's a great idea, but be prepared. You'll have a 30 to 50 member church, not one of 500 to 1,000 members because it's not what people want to hear today, right? It's not what people want to hear. It's not whether it's true or whether it is the truth. It's what they want to hear. Their ears will be tickled, right? Well, guess what? They started the church and started out like 280, 300 people. But by the time people saw that they were giving, they were having communion, the body and blood of Christ on Sundays. And during communion, guess what? You're getting five minutes to sit there and pray and be alone, silence. Before you know it, within a month, or maybe a little more, they had a 30 to 50 member church. <laughs> Just like Pete said, right? So it didn't really, the church didn't last. And like I said, the people of today, especially even more so today, want their ears tickled with things that lift them up. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to be rich. God is God of love. He blesses everyone. He accepts everyone. God loves everyone, but God will judge the wicked, especially the pastors who are leading their sheep astray. That's coming, right? So, you know, many of today's uh, pastors and priests, especially in the larger churches, know this. So they give people what they want to hear. We wouldn't have a drug problem if people weren't seeking out illegal drugs, right? Same kind of thing. We are given by God what we are seeking. And we are seeking feel-good messages. That's what we're getting. And who's getting rich off of it? those pastors, right? And they're doing us a disservice, they're doing you a disservice. So one of the things Charlie Kirk talked about, he brought up Billy Graham, and how Billy Graham spoke to like 100,000 people. And where, what was his message? His message was about sin, and hell, and death, and repentance. That's what Charlie Kirk said. How often do you hear that in your church? How often do you hear, if you don't repent, you're going to hell? If you don't repent, you are going to hell. Or, we are sinners. We are all sinners. We constantly sin. That's why we constantly need to repent, to ask God, to confess our sins. Yes, he knows what they are. You still should confess them, whether it's to a priest, because that's what you want, right? Or to, or to God directly, you want to confess your sins daily. And he wants to hear that you know you're a sinner, 
All right. So, um, what I said here after this too is I know firsthand most people are completely happy with where they are. And that is, I can preach so I'm blue in the face. You're not going to get off Facebook. You're not going to get off Twitter because Elon Musk is the new hero of free speech, right? You're not going to get off Instagram or TikTok. And you're not going to change churches. I'm not asking you to join our church. We're not a membership church. I'm not asking you for donations. I'm asking you, which is what Charlie Kirk said, it's up to you, the congregation, to call out that pastor, to change what's going on in your church. We have to change what's going on. We have to say, we're leaving this church if it doesn't change, right? I'll, I'll, do, I'll go off of this for a little bit. So Charlie said, three types of pastors, cowards, right? Courageous, coward, complicit. The courageous pastors were very far and few between. They stayed open during the pandemic. They defied it. They didn't care if they were fined. They didn't care what happened to them. They were preaching the word of God to their sheep, their faithful, and they would not be deterred. No one was going to stop them. And I know, even we, Karen and I talk about EWTN, but guess what? They complied because they listened to the overall Catholic leadership in our nation, which listened, listens to the Pope, right? So they complied. They shouldn't have. I mean, they still had service that you could watch on TV, but you couldn't go. Right? So there were the cowards. Right? And there are cowards. The cowards who are afraid to speak the truth because it might offend you. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'll be that 30 to 50 member church. Right now I have a thousand people donating to me, helping me build this nice building and having more people who I can ask, oh, go raise money, because we need to go to Africa or Asia or Iran or the Netherlands or somewhere and preach the gospel. No. Have that 30 to 50 member church of true believers. They're cowards. They're afraid they're going to offend you or have a nasty word, as Charlie Kirk said, written about them in the newspaper. You know, I looked up Charlie Kirk and a few years ago during the pandemic. He spoke, or right after, um, he, or sometime, in the, you know, a few years ago, he spoke at a church here in Coeur d'Alene. And he said, Ruth, Gator ben, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is dead and she's burning in hell. Wow. That's what I said. The things he said were just unbelievable. He is so bold and speaks truth. And he says, I know there's media here. They'll write about me. I don't care. That's what we have to say. We'll speak the truth. We don't care. Right? And like I said, so many of you that I'm speaking to, <laughs> I'm happy with my church. And you'll find all kinds of excuses as to why it's so good. And there are good ones out there. There really are. There are great pastors out there that are bold. All right, so you're either courageous, you're either cowardly, or you're complicit. The complicit church had the Black Lives Matter flag, right? Or flies a gay flag, great gay pride flag, or talks to you about how it's so wrong to be so white. He said, run from those churches. Don't give them the chance, run. They are just complicit. All right. So, you know, what I wrote about that, sorry for the diversion, the Christian voter of today, right? They vote Republican. Oh, because Republicans are conservative. But they didn't really look at the moral character of the person running or what he or she was really about. Because as Steve Bannon says, Republicans have won more elections than they've lost in the last 50 years or 60 years, and look at the state of our country. Where is it? We're fighting for parental rights? We're fighting for them? Huh. Anyway, 
So, back to my message. How do you know if your church is woke? Let's take a look at some of the signs, all right? So this kind of ties into what I was already saying. So pay attention to the words your pastor or priest says, right? One of the main differences between the progressive church and the historically Christian church, the true Bible-believing church, right, is how they have viewed the Bible and the Word of God, right? And it's true authority in our lives. Progressive Christian churches generally abandon um, term, you know, these terms, right? They're not talking about sin. They're not talking about death or judgment, okay? They, they, um, they may say things like the Bible contains the Word of God or the Bible condones immorality, right? Because it doesn't mention homosexuality. It doesn't say it's a sin or whatever they might say, but it's patently false. But the progressive church preys on folks that are probably fairly new to Christianity or are lazy, lukewarm Christians, right? And they do not know the Bible. They haven't taken the time to read, read the Word of God or participate in a real Bible study that tells you what it means. The truth, not any watered-down versions, right? The Bible is the Word of God, and the Bible does not condone immorality anywhere. And yes, it also, um, one of the other things that Charlie Kirk said to be on the watch for too, is they try to eliminate the Old Testament. They talk mostly about things in the New Testament, right? Where the Bible is one, this is one complete story. You can't just read the Psalms or the Gospel of John, right? And think you're done. This is a whole story. There's a lot to it. And it's meant to be that way. The Catholic Church put this together for a reason. <laughs> you hate when you hear that, don't you? Anyway, okay, so another thing, watch for pastors that emphasize feelings over facts. In the progressive or seeker type churches, personal experiences, feelings, and opinions tend to be valued over objective truth. As the Bible ceases to be viewed as God's definitive word, what a person feels to be true becomes the ultimate authority for their faith and their practice. So you may hear things like, we welcome everyone here today. I met some gay people and they were so nice. Homosexuality can't be a sin. These people are so nice and they're good. They do good works. Hmm. What I wrote, don't even get me started. I'm just gonna pass over that because I could talk for an hour on that. But homosexuality is a sin it's not to be welcomed in any way, shape, or form. I was thinking about this as I reread it before I started um, our service. Uh, Donald Trump, the greatest president in our time, for our economy, for putting things in our wallets, and yes, for putting judges to that we could celebrate Roe versus Wade is no longer, the murder of children is no longer federal law. But in many ways, he condones because he wants the votes, right? He has people that are openly homosexual speaking, touring, helping him in his cabinet. That's not right. Sometimes I wish, I wish there was a man or a woman who is of pure godly character, truly, and not a watered down Christian, strong, the Billy Graham type that ran for office that would be able to uphold morality. But with our ears wanting to be tickled, we'd probably never get elected, right? Because we're told about tolerance. All right, and then number three, essential Christian doctrines are open for reinterpretation. Progressive or seeker churches often are often open to redefining or reinterpreting the Bible on hot button moral issues like homosexuality and abortion, right? And also cardinal doctrines, such as the virgin birth 
and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So you can listen for statements like, the church's position on sexuality is archaic. We need to update it to fit our culture. Our culture changed. The church needs to change with the culture. No, we need to stand bold in the face of culture. We're not to be smart. We're, we're not to be part of the culture, right? Not of this earth. We're not of this world, I think it is. N-O-W, yes. So, I wrote here, you know, Billy Graham, and we just talked about Billy Graham, right? And, um, you know, we talked about abortion, and Charlie Kirk brought up a good thing about it, you know, abortion, the sacrifice of children. Look what happened, he said, we as parents or grandparents, we're supposed to leave something better for our next generation. We're supposed to protect our children and grandchildren. But look what we did during the pandemic. We let the schools be closed. We're forcing them to take a, a shot. That's not, not in any way good for them. We're sacrificing our own children just like we sacrifice babies. I mean, we are such an immoral culture, it isn't funny. And I originally thought when I was writing this that I want to say, so abortion, tolerance, right? Tolerance and getting us to accept. So this is what Charlie said, tolerance, and then it's acceptance, then it's celebrating it, and then it's participation in it. The gay community, tolerance, acceptance, we must celebrate it with them. We must bake their cakes. We must photograph their weddings. We must perform their services. Right? Participation. That's the last one. Right? And not just the gay, the transgender movement, everything. That's what Satan does. First tolerance, then acceptance, then celebration, then participation. That's Charlie Kirk. And he's so right on about it. We can't tolerate it. That's where we have to stop it. And, he, you know, I started to say, so I was going to go back to, like, abortion and then gay marriage. But he brought up an in interesting concept. It started where we tolerated it and accepted it back in the 60s with the liberal Warren court that took prayer out of schools, separation of church and state, which is in the Constitution, it's in a letter. And it was just a letter written to guarantee people they had the freedom to worship that one religion wasn't going to be um, forced upon them. It has nothing to do with the separation of church and state. It's a big misconception. Don't buy into it. Don't accept it. Don't tolerate it. Don't participate in it. Don't celebrate it. It's wrong. He was big on homeschool. As you know, Charlie has a book about a college scam. And I encourage you all to get it. All right? You know, they talk about there cannot be a hell. Where do you, where do you hear about hell? If you go to a Catholic service, you're going to hear about it. Where do you hear about hell? Where do you hear about sin? Everything's all lovey-dovey. It's not lovey-dovey. Look at our readings today. Just read this book. Jesus, the Old Testament. Oh, that old God. He's not the same God anymore. Jesus came to change that. No. Jesus came to emphasize it. And he even says it. Okay? <coughs> and that leads to the fourth one. The word that gets to progressive makeover in progressive and seeker type churches. And that's, I'm using seeker, I wrote progressive in here, but Charlie Kirk used the word the seeker church movement. The seeker church movement, starting in the late 60s, early 70s, is what destroys many of the, is, is destroying Christianity in America. The word love, right? When plucked out of its biblical context, it becomes a catch-all term for everything non-confrontive, right? Pleasant and affirming. Progressive churches constantly throw this word in your face. Listen for things like 
God wouldn't punish sinners. He's a God of love. It's okay if you sin. He expects you to sin. You're a flawed human being. Right? It's not our job to talk about anyone, talk to anyone about sin. It's our job to just love them. Charlie, right, Karen? Charlie talked about that too. It is our job. We are to judge them. We are to talk about them, talk to them about God, and correct and try to correct their ways. All right? I mean, because loving them, if you're a parent, you don't let your kid just do whatever they want if you do. <laughs> Your kid's going to end up on investigative, investigation discovery for sure. All right? You want to correct them. You love them. You don't accept everything they do, but no matter what they do, you love them. And that's how God loves us. But we must come to him, we must repent, and we must continue to stand strong and bold in his word. Right? I mean, really... I ended it with, where does Jesus confirm any of these woke policies that are around today? Show me. Show me where there are more than two genders in the Bible. Show me where if somebody says, I feel like I'm a girl, I'm a girl. No, there are men and there are women. There are boys and there are girls. And you as a parent are destroying your own child if you let them tell you what they are. Don't be afraid. That's the other thing. It's fear. We're so afraid. Like Charlie said, he's so bold when he speaks in public because people are afraid. They're afraid something might get written about them. They're afraid of losing their stuff, right? They're afraid of losing their stuff. I might lose my job. I might lose my friends. I might lose my family. Oh my gosh. Tough. You're not going to lose him. Or your eternity. Because that's what depends on it. Your eternity. So I suggest take a good hard look at where, look at where you're worshiping. Alright? Get a group together. If you're hearing any of this in your church, give them a chance to change. But if they don't, look, there are plenty of churches around, 40,000 denominations and county. You must be able to find one that speaks boldly and speaks the truth. Okay? I was going to go into a whole big thing about all that and fear, and, but I'm out of time. Okay? So now we're going to do something that we believe is essential to every service, and that is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This man on the cross, yes, he is off the cross. But what does that empty cross show you? Oh, yes, that he conquered death, so we have eternal life. What does this show you? What he did for us. Like well, I said in the beginning, it's a reminder, right? A reminder of who we are and what he did if we're sinners. And that's why if you take this body and blood seriously, it, it is his body and blood. Right? Jesus talked about he couldn't perform miracles where they didn't have faith in him and then believe in things. And we tend to only believe things today that are materialistic, that we can see and touch and feel. I can't see this being his body and blood. We forget our God is capable of anything. And if you close your eyes and ask him to come into your heart and truly, truly believe this body, this bread, and this wine are his body and blood, guess what? He will make it so. He rewards the faithful. Okay. Enough, right? I went way too long. So, Lord, you are holy indeed, the fount of all holiness. Make therefore these gifts, we pray, by sending down upon your spirit, your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. How about that, huh? So, first, go back to the DDK around 50 AD. First, concerning the cup. We give you thanks, our Father, for the holy vine of David, your servant, 
which you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you be the glory forever and, and ever. Concerning the broken bread, we give you thanks, our Father, for the life and the knowledge that you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you be the glory forever and ever. And just as this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains and then was gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom, oh, I'm sorry, gathered together and became one, so may your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. Think about that. That's what the apostles and their disciples were praying when they held church. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that by partaking of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. So through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. So let us now pray the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Right? So this is awkward because it's how it's written in the Gospel of Matthew, not the more modern version. Okay? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not subject us to the final test, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. So deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I give you, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who will live and reign forever and ever. Amen. So the peace of the Lord be with you always. Now let us offer each other a sign of peace. If you're watching this with others, which we pray you are, all right? Wish them peace. Hug them. Peace be with you, right? Oh, you know, in church last night, it was turn to, your, turn to your right and say, blah, blah, blah. Turn to your right, left, look ahead, look back, and say, peace be with you. Or like I do because my sweetheart is back there making sure camera doesn't run out of juice or whatever <laughs> I say peace to you my sweetheart I love you Karen okay so behold the Lamb of God right behold him who takes away the sins of the world and blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb and we all say, Lord, I am not worthy to enter under your roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. None of us are worthy of this. None of us. It is he 
who makes us worthy. So, the body of Christ, folks. the blood of Christ. Well, this is your first service. I hope you return. <laughs> and we can you can always go on Rumble, One God, One Church. YouTube, One God, One Church. All right? Look at all of our other services. You can go on our webpage, www.og-oc.com. Uh, it's in serious need of upgrade and update. But there are a lot of great videos on there. All right? Other resources. And um, I, I, I do seriously need to put some time into that because I let it go. My own selfishness and doing fun things like seeing Charlie Kirk or going to the Great Reawakening with General Mike Flynn and, and uh, Clay Clark and Dr. Stella Emanuel on them and going to see our former President Donald Trump in Nevada. Fun things, <laughs> but important things too. So before we have our last prayer, I do want to say uh, something else Charlie Kirk said that it amazes him at the churches today, that he walks into a service and he feels like he's at a rock concert. There's rock music blaring, and they sing and sing and sing, and at the end, after the song, the pastor says, you know, a few quote, a few scriptures from, a few lines from Philippians or something, and says a couple of words and then says, okay, thanks. See you next week. That's what he said. Interesting, isn't it? No need to be screaming and yelling. No need to have rock concerts. If you preach the truth, that's what God wants. That's what he wants all pastors to do. Not, oh, we need to do this to attract people. Uh, you know what? It's not, it's not really true. So, I'm wearing black, a black shirt, okay? So November 4th, this Friday, will be two years, my brother Jake left us. Like I said, John. Remember me saying John, the one beloved by Jesus, the one Jesus loved most? Well, in our family, it was Thomas, John, David. John became Jake because he liked that name. But guess what? The one Jesus loved the most, he took first. Kathy, our sister. Right? St. Catherine. So, two things I keep in my pocket. I don't care what pocket it is. Pajamas, pants to go outside to go shopping or go to an event or just go out. My work pants, it doesn't matter. I have a rosary. Truly the greatest weapon. Pray the rosary, I encourage you. And then this. The last time Karen and I saw my brother, this is the folder from Shields where he and I went together, sporting goods, to get fishing licenses. It's always in my pocket, Jake. I love you. I miss you. I thank you for being such a great brother. And I hope I'm worthy enough to see you one day. Okay? So with that, let's bow our heads for our final blessing. Having tasted your goodness, Lord, send us out as changed people. 
because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same.